First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present. Um, unlike many of the other speakers, I don't have a lab. Uh, and I've only uh, been doing this for a few years, so I can't go through you know, my slides of greatest hits. But I hope uh, I can share with you some of the interesting work uh, that I've been doing at the Allen Institute uh, for Cell Science up in Seattle. Oh, also, like uh, many of the uh, previous speakers, I slightly changed my title. Um, but I didn't actually change any content. So uh, I'm up at the Allen Institute for Cell Science uh, in Seattle. And we're interested in creating sort of a dynamic image-based landscape of human-induced pluripotent stem cell uh, states and mechanisms underlying the differentiation of these cells. Uh, as a part of this, we're taking tons and tons of images. Uh, we have uh, many, many teams, software engineering, gene editing, assay development, microscopy. I'm on the modeling team. Uh, there's an animated cell team to help us communicate and visualize our data. I hope that was everybody. Uh, they're all watching me right now. Um, and uh, that uh, encompasses about 75 people. And we hope that uh, research at this scale allows us to do uh, some, uh, some things that are not possible at a typical lab size. Uh, and as a part of this, we're sharing all of our data, our tools, our methodology, uh, and uh, ways of uh, deploying and sharing our infrastructure. Uh, as a part of our main, so our main uh, type of data is a, a field of cells taken on a confocal uh, fluorescence microscope. So this is a sort of a cartoon or an illustration of what one of these uh, data cubes looks like. And uh, what you can see here are individual regions corresponding to individual cells. And we can segment out individual cells and compute statistics on those and do all the nice things that you do with cell images. As a part of uh, um, this sort of interrogation process, we can also label these cells with a green fluorescent protein that localizes to a particular subcellular structure. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you sort of like a slice in this three-dimensional image of a particular protein localization pattern. Uh, and from this data, we've had a lot of various successes building uh, models and uh, figuring out sort of what exactly is the biology that's going on. Uh, one of our sort of like our big uh, successes is this idea of uh, label-free imaging or virtual staining, where we can take a very, very cheap transmitted light image and use a neural network to predict a, a protein location or organelle location patterns from that image. And this allows us to integrate these fluorescent images across different, different experiments and get a view, uh, a sort of a hypothesis a generator for how these components are organized in our cells. But one of the things that this, or this model doesn't, this model uh, uh, could be improved in two major ways. One of which is uh, if we have this bright field image, uh, what is the distribution of possible uh, fluorescent images that could be associated with that, as well as uh, how does this work, or what is this variation for at the individual cell level? Uh, so what I'm showing you here are images of individual cells with uh, a DNA labeled in cyan, cell membrane labeled in magenta, and a particular protein location pattern in yellow. And I hope you can appreciate that there's a large variation in the organization of these different structures. Um, and it's sort of like a, a game that we're going to play uh, really quick is I want, I want to know what the relationship is between these structures that I'm observing inside of the cell. And so what I could do is I could train a model on some examples. So here's some cells with mitochondria labeled in these images. And I can use that to predict where mitochondria are here. 
So I'd like all of you to do the same. So think in your head where those mitochondria could be. Uh, because you're all fantastic cell biologists, I'm sure you guessed something that looked like a mitochondrial image, but you probably didn't get this one, okay? Sort of like to really drive this home, I want, I'm showing you another organelle location pattern, uh, which is a nuclear membrane. And in your model that you're building in your head, I want you to guess where uh, the nuclear membrane is in this image on the side. Oh, that's incredible. You guys guessed it. You nailed it because you guys are such good cell biologists. So what I'm showing you here now are cells in three different states going through mitosis. And I want you to use the knowledge that you already have uh, and the examples that you've seen to estimate where the nuclear membrane is here. OK, wow, you got, you got this one. Great. OK, well, maybe you you were off by a little bit. And oh, OK, well, maybe you were totally right because your model was generalized very well. Or uh, maybe you're totally wrong because there wasn't sufficient data for you to make this generalization. Or maybe you just had a bad model. I don't know. Um, and what we really want to be able to do is model when and where these structures are related uh, to each other as cells move from state to state. And sort of to more uh, be a little more formal, we want to know, given some structures inside of the cell, how much information is required to describe another observation. So I've sort of guessed and sorted these, uh, these ye yellow channels by how much information I would require to describe where that structure is, uh, given the information in the cell at nuclear shape. And uh, so we can do this uh, with uh, uh, models such as variational autoencoders, uh, sort of like a, a popular model here uh, this, this week. And these models are useful for a bunch of things. So they're generative models. I can make you pretty pictures of ourselves. Uh, they are useful for building latent representations. So I can uh, build a latent representation and show you the first two dimensions, or I can UMAP that. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and these models are also useful for density estimation. So uh, I want to uh, interpret the probability density of some data that I have. And that probability density is a function of uh, how well this network reconstructs the input from the output minus how complicated the representation of the data is. And what I can do is, because this is a neural network and the architecture is very flexible and I can condition my representation on all sorts of information, I can factor out this probability of a, of a structure, the cell shape, the DNA shape, as a function of a structure given the cell and DNA times the probability of the cell and DNA to, uh, or arbitrary other factorizations, uh, so I can ask specific questions of my data. So if I see the cell uh, in nuclear shape, should I be surprised? If I uh, uh, see the structure in the cell in nuclear shape, should I be surprised, and so on and so forth. So what I can do is take my corpus of cell images and then throw them on the scatter plot, plotting these two quantities against each other. And because this is a neural network, it's really great. I don't have to make some sort of representation of my image. I just toss my image into my neural network, or in this case, the factored out uh, representation. I can just toss these, uh, uh, these actual images of these structures and get quantities corresponding to those uh, density estimates out. So what I'm showing you here is a plot of the uh, approximate probability of the, uh, this cell and nuclear shape observation times the probability of the structure given the cell and nuclear shape. On the left-hand side are, and it's very hard to see in this projector, uh, but this uh, prompting display is really great. Uh, um, the ex very eccentric and odd cell and nuclear shapes, while over here there's a the majority of density is like these round, prototypical, induced pluripotent stem cells. 
And what I also hope you can appreciate is that on the, uh, up at the top, so up at the top are more probable observations, and down here is, is when uh, this nucleolar protein disassociates from the DNA and spreads throughout the cell in sort of a random distribution, a distribution that's difficult to predict given the cell and nuclear shape information that I have. And because this is a neural network and we have lots of different structures, we can apply this to all sorts of, of cells uh, with different labeled structures under different conditions. And for example, we can identify that uh, this sort of prototypical uh, double spindle, the localization pattern associated with microtubules and mitosis occurs. And it's, let's say it's not very surprising given that the cell is in mitosis. This is very typical, it's stereotyped, so on and so forth. Um, but what I really want to know is what components of my observation uh, are the ones that are allowing me to make this prediction. In other words, uh, over here, I'm, I'm pointing at the prompt thing with my laser. Uh, over here, uh, maybe there's more information about the DNA that's helping me uh, inform where this uh, nucleolar, or uh, sorry, nuclear membrane structure is. And as the cell changes state, this relationship changes. And I want to be able to automatically identify the change in these relationships uh, in my population or uh, with the cells under the various conditions that I'm interested in. So what we can do is we can just measure the sensitivity of our model to uh, dropping out or uh, permuting uh, the uh, various structures. So what I'm showing you here is, a, is another scatter plot where sensitivity to, of the density prediction to DNA morphology versus the sensitivity of the density prediction to cell morphology. And we can see here that the, the model believes that uh, the DNA morphology is helping me predict where the, the nuclear membrane is, which makes a lot of sense. And then as the cell changes state, it moves from a dependent on DNA state to a dependent on, or statistically dependent on, uh, cell membrane state. And of course, this happens very, uh, very clearly as well with microtubules and uh, cells undergoing mitosis, where this sort of information where the, of where the microtubules are is all coupled to the cell membrane and then moves to uh, sort of shared cell membrane nuclear shape uh, information. Of course, uh, this is just tying together uh, some types of measurements that uh, we have of our cells, and we don't need to limit ourselves to just protein location patterns. This, uh, as uh, we've sort of like, one of the major themes here is that these neural networks are very flexible we can allow them to sort of uh, interface with various types of data. And one of the things that we want to do is link uh, cell organization and morphology to gene expression. And uh, sort of what uh, uh, one of the best or most straightforward ways to do this is with fish experiments, where we can take a tissue and uh, introduce a probe that localizes uh, to uh, particular RNAs, and then you can count those spots and get a an, an measure of gene expression. And one of the ways that we can measure the relationship between cell morphology and gene expression is by just segmenting out individual cells, computing statistics on those cells, and just building like a linear regression model to estimate uh, the gene expression uh, of uh, that particular probe for that particular cell. And what I'm showing you uh, here on the x-axis is sort of the true normalized value for that gene and the predicted value of that gene uh, for, diff for cardiomyocyte cells in different states um, uh, for three different types of cardiomyocyte markers, indicating that uh, uh, sort of as a basic proof of concept,
that performing this type of linkage uh, is uh, definitely possible and relatively straightforward. But we don't really want to say that uh, uh, this sort of like, or what we're interested in is not particularly uh, predicting gene expression, but figuring out when and where these things are related to each other. So this sort of hunt is not, is not like, I don't want to generate you a vector of the expression of this gene. I want to know from this image how much variation there could be in the gene, the expression of the gene, and then say, how does that variation change as we look at cells under different types of states? Um, but we don't need to do this from features, uh, features or uh, sort of like um, linear models that may not generalize well. We, can, we may be able to do this from images directly. So using the same uh, uh, virtual staining approach, we trained a, bright, uh, we trained a model to predict a uh, fish gene expression image uh, from the bright field image alone. And I hope that you can appreciate that there is a strong correlation here. It is much better. Uh, one of the sort of like, when you look at this at first, you're like, oh, well, maybe it's just guessing where cells are. Uh, it's, it is doing a very good job at that. Uh, but it is uh, doing this much, much better than you would expect by random. Uh, or it's, do, it's performing the uh, uh, prediction of gene expression much, much better than random. And uh, this sort of like is driving us towards this idea that we can measure these cells in all sorts of different ways. We can do it with like uh, paired experiments for different types of uh, high throughput methods. We can do it with unpaired experiments where we can do distribution matching. And what we really want to be able to do is link data over all of these different uh, uh, sort of profiling methods to get an overarching view of the landscape of uh, cell organization and how these signals are related to each other. So uh, as to wrap this up, this is definitely not work that I did all by myself. Uh, we have a ton of people, both in the Allen Institute for Cell Science, as well as the Allen Institute for Brain Science and our new Allen Institute for Immunology, all in the same building. Um, there uh, is tons and tons of work, and especially uh, tons of help from our collaborators, many of which are in this room. And I'd also like to thank uh, Paul Allen, uh, who, is, who uh, was very generous, and uh, this sort of work uh, uh, supports his, his vision, and uh, we hope to um, uh, help you guys and the rest of the community as much as possible uh, with our research efforts. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We have time for questions. Hi, Greg. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was curious about some of those algorithms you were showing for predicting spatial organization within the cell. I was curious about, so say you train on a certain cell line, is there any preliminary evidence to indicate how transferable that is to additional cell lines, or do you have to retrain on every single cell Yeah, line? Uh, so we have found that the, the real answer is it depends. Um, for most of these sort of like virtual staining models are um, sort of like a combined deconvolution and filtering method that's looking for sort of contrast in the bright field image. And the mechanism of how, a, uh, how that contrast is associated with a particular uh, subcellular structure may change as the cell differentiates. So um, sort of like the location of myosin in a normal cell versus a cardiomyocyte uh, totally changes throughout the differentiation process, and therefore its association with um, these things. So near, quote, if you can look at these cells and you're confused about whether or not they're the same cell type, then it will probably work fine. And if you can look at these cells and you're, you're very certain that they're not the cell same cell type from the bright field image, 
uh, you may need to retrain or at least train a model on both of the cell types simultaneously. Anyway, thanks for a great talk. I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned that the nuclear morphology was like a very strong predictor of cell state. Uh, nuclear morph morphology has been used by pathologists for years in diagnosing tumor prognosis, for example. Yeah. And so I'm just like curious as to like what other organelles that you've looked at since you have all this data that are like strongly predictive of cell state. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So um, I think it if one way to answer it is, or a non-answer is like what it depends what you mean by cell state. Um, the uh, I think mitochondria is like a is a very uh, sort of like uh, common and well known uh, regulator of like uh, or associate its morphology is associated with cell metabolism and so that's maybe a state that we care about uh, for our data set um, we found that the best predictor is bright field image because it's uh, abundantly available and uh, you can get, you can squeeze a whole ton of data out of it. The big problem with that is that it is, uh, I would say, a non-human interpretable image. Uh, it's very, very difficult to tell what's going on. Um, and so, which is why we're sort of moving from focusing on uh, correlating things with bright field images to uh, doing this correlation across structures. Uh, just a question on the bright field images. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, uh, like interpretation or visualization tools to like interpret what's going on in the neural networks. Have you ever looked into your neural networks or like about like the focus of the neurons, like where they are looking in terms of your bright field images? Like whether like what can you learn from that? No. Ah, uh, really great talk. So, uh, I have a question about uh, like, uh, uh, is there any way to check the quality of uh, the uh, image generation, especially you have uh, multiple subcellular uh, structures like uh, ER mitochondria? Yeah. Because uh, seems in your paper you generate them separately. So, is there any way to avoid the overlap of uh, different? Uh, subcellular structures in the same yeah. Uh, positions. Yeah, so I think one of the um, sort of roles that all of us take here are when we build these types of models, build into them sort of biological priors. And I think what you were getting at is we know that many of these organelles do not intersect with each other. And uh, how can we build uh, those biological priors into our model? Um, we've thought about that. And I think it is has a lot to do with just building a penalty for like correlation or building a penalty for bright pixels being in the same place at the same time. We haven't done that, um, but there's plenty of work to be done uh, with these types of models and uh, being able to get them to build the best sort of latent representations and uh, the best uh, generated images possible. 